were supposed to be um, not that straight. Um, so, yeah, as you heard, my name is Christian, and I'm, I'm going to talk about some research work of mine, which I was um, involved in for about one and a half years. Should I? Is that better? No? <laughs> Sit it. Simply. Yeah, well, that starts off very really well. Um, it's not getting better. So, is there an, a level? You should hold it the whole time. So, you can really not hear me? Or should you put it down? Test, test, test. Really? Awesome. Um, so, uh, yeah, analyzing and detecting flash plasma odor. And this is joint work with um, Fabian Yamaguchi, Daniel Arp, and um, Conrad Rieck. So, um, let me say a few words about myself um, beforehand. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at the newly established um, Institute of System Security in Brunswick, Germany. So, we moved there um, from the University of Göttingen. Um, recently, and we are happy that we ended up at the oldest institute of technology in, in Germany, and we now have this um, 40 years long um, history of computer science and are surrounded by nerds, engineers, and as a matter of fact, um, rocket scientists. So I um, kind of like to think of Braunschweig as this um, all rational and pragmatic place, so, although I'm not really sure that that's really the case, but, and this is going to turn out as a fun fact, we do have this Braunschweiger Schloss, which is a city castle built in the 1700s, but destroyed in World War II, and it's actually a shopping mall. So the, the city didn't have enough money to build the, the castle, so they sold the place to some investor who wanted to build this, this shopping mall. So they simply took the money and built the, the castle anyways, but only the, the surroundings. So in there, it's actually this, this weird shopping mall, and on the right side there's Starbucks, and in the middle some H&M um, store. And the funny thing is that I was in this um, shopping mall before, and I only learned about this fact um, about three weeks ago. So, yeah, how much pragmatic can it be? Get, I guess. Anyhow, so um, let's talk about malware. Um, so malicious software is one of the um, lasting problems we have in um, computer security. And over the years, we saw different variations, such as Trojan, Spots, Ad Adware, Ransomware, um, and so on. And also um, for targeted attacks, um, malware is increasingly used. And probably it doesn't take anybody by surprise that there also is malware for the Adobe Flash platform. Um, for instance, for conducting drive-by downloads, malicious redirects, um, fingerprinting the environment, exploiting the Flash player, exploiting the browser, um, and so on. So um, we do have HTML5, and this would really nicely replace many of the functionalities um, Flash provides. And as a matter of fact, um, many browser vendors start banning the, the Flash plugins from their products. But nevertheless, um, Flash is um, deployed on millions of devices across different platforms. And even worse, um, about every fourth website among the um, Alexa 1000 ranking still makes use of Flash for some kind of dynamic and multimedia content. For instance, for advertisement, video streaming, betting portals, gaming, and so on. And one reason um, why um, Flash is so popular in this um, field of application is that it came, or since the early days, it came with a uh, rather powerful scripting language, namely ActionScript, which, similar to JavaScript, is one, um, or a dialect of um, the ECMAScript standard. And during the last 20 or 20 years of deployment, um, users have, well, almost regularly being at risk of being um, attacked through this um, 
platform. And in the um, last year or so, we saw a tremendous increase in um, new vulnerabilities found for this um, platform. So I did this um, um, figure for a, a talk last year um, on some preliminary work of, of this one, and I plotted the, the number of um, CEs over the, the years of their occurrence and fitted this nice curve in there showing that there's some kind of um, exponential growth um, in the number of um, vulnerabilities found. And for this talk, I updated the numbers and ran the script for the, the figure again, and the scale basically exploded. And the reason for this is that in the last three months of 2015, um, the number of exploits or vulnerabilities found um, almost doubled. And 85% of these actually allow um, remote code execution. So the point I tried to make last year is the same as this year. So the number of um, vulnerabilities simply um, increased by a lot. So flash security still is an issue, and so is flash based malware. Um, if we have a look at um, attack scenarios and attack scenarios for flash based malware, we can categorize these in yeah, roughly um, three different classes. Um, so we start with the um, structural exploits of the flash play itself. So imagine you get a malformed um, flash animation, um, which contains some value there, the parser or the, the interpreter doesn't detect them. For instance, buffer flow overflow is possible and allows remote code execution. Um, the second class um, is this, this huge class of um, malicious action script code. Um, so action script code that is used for launching and preparing exploits. Think of um, obfuscation and think of feed string and stuff like this. Um, third, um, environment fingerprinting. And this is kind of overlapping with the, the previous class as it's also using action script code, um, but for a specific purpose of selecting the target um, to exploit. And of course, um, an attack in practice will almost always fall in more than the, um, one of these um, categories. Um, when you have a look at um, obfuscation for flash based malware, um, we see that stage execution is quite a thing. So the dynamic loading of, of code at runtime, and for, for JavaScript, for instance, you have this, this evil function, um, which you also have for ActionScript 2, but not for ActionScript 3. But both version of, versions of language allow you to um, dynamically load other Flash animations. And these animations can, again, contain ActionScript code. And even worse, those animations can be assembled at runtime or downloaded from the internet. So this opens um, the door for all kinds of more sophisticated um, obfuscation techniques, such as layered encryption and polymorphism. So basically everything you know from runtime packers um, on different platforms. And then we have something that is um, rather unique for, for Flash. So it, this, this loading on diff different um, Flash animations allows you to um, exploit leg legacy code, so you basically have two different um, virtual machines for um, flash files of version 8 and before. So these are those that contain action script 2 and before, and starting with 9 you had um, action script 3. So if you want to exploit an, a rather old bug in the, the previous um, AVM, you can simply load a an old flash file basically to arrive at the other um, virtual machine. Then of course you have um, all kinds of source code obfuscation. So if you decompile um, your flash animation or the extra script code contained in there, you find um, substitutions of variable names, assembly of strings, dead code, and so on. So everything you know from, from other platforms. And again, um, probing the execution environment is um, quite popular. So you only trigger your payload if you know that you are on a specific platform and that you know that you are able to exploit um, this particular um, version of the flash play. And with this, um, Flash and action, action Script provides you with um, 
quite some um, possibilities. And the most popular probably is this capability struct, which has um, slightly different names on these two um, versions of the language. Um, and it contains um, the kind of um, integrator, its version, the operating system, whether or not it's debugged or not. And down here we see a, a, a check for the versions of a recent um, malware sample, which is simply checking for the six versions of um, the flash player on Windows. And if it's not able to, well, if it's not one of these um, versions, it's able to exploit, it simply returns and does nothing. Um, <coughs> so what we did to um, address these different kinds of attacks for, for Flash is to develop um, Gordon, uh, which is a um, platform for the comprehensive analysis of um, Flash animations in general. And this builds up in basically three different um, building blocks. So we have a structural analysis, to address these structural exploits. Um, so this is a static analysis, and then we have a dynamic analysis of the contained action script code. Um, though with a little twist, which we then, well, dubbed um, the guided code execution. And built on these two analysis steps, um, we built a, a detector using machine learning techniques, which allows us to um, detect 90 to 95 um, percent of all our um, malware um, samples in, the, in our data set with um, rather low um, false positive rates, which allowed us to significantly outperform um, similar or related approaches. And the nice thing about the, um, our technique is that we do not um, need to um, manually construct any detection rules or, or features, um, but all this is done implicitly um, by um, um, our algorithms, but I will come to that um, later on. So, um, Flash is composed, or the animations are composed out of um, little containers, which are called um, tags. And these containers may contain action script code or specifications for the, for the animation itself, or audio, video, image data, and so on. And right now, um, Recent versions of Flash support about or a little less than um, 100 different types of such tags. And although the, the number may um, grow in future versions, so this is kind of a, a way to allow um, extensibility to the file format without actually changing the, the file format. So, um, yeah. Um, also, these tags may appear um, nested within each other. And you see that this, or the sheer number of different tags and this possibility of being nested already inhibits quite some, some structure in, in the file. And also, um, you can imagine that these different subparts of folders, um, containers, um, offer a huge attack surface for um, memory corruption exploits, for instance. And yeah, for instance, this, this um, vulnerability from 10 years ago, um, um, simply allowed you on providing a negative scene count value to overflow a buffer and execute code. Um, but also in more recent um, vulnerabilities, you see that um, exploits rely on really specific um, tags or specific sequences of such tags. And um, this is how such a um, structure report looks like, so we simply so this is the, the same malware, fam or malware sample we saw earlier when discussing this, this version check. And we simply list the um, different tags. So on the left hand side we have the tag ID and the tag no um, name on the right. And um, over here um, we have some nested tags. And down there um, we have this um, new ABC tag which contains action script code. And before that, we have two defined binary tags, which actually um, contain um, the payload that is dropped by the, the flash based malware. Um, so, you can imagine that um, if you see these three tags, it's, well, it at least allows you to narrow down a decision towards this, this malware family. Um, this view is, um, 
quite nice for, for an analyst, of course, so it's cool model for Kerberos. Um, if you try to um, process this automatically, such as for our detector, you want to have some um, little more context and just um, simply um, note down the, the tag IDs um, plus these brackets for um, indicating the structure of the nested tags. Um, yeah. So for the dynamic analysis of the action script code contained or code in general, um, we learned over the years that a single execution, um, especially as is, is not enough. And covering all execution paths isn't, well, it's possible either because there are simply too many of those. So we need some kind of um, heuristic to um, tackle this problem. And in the past we saw different um, approaches usual. Um, one is to um, only inspect execution paths that are influenced by external input, um, as for instance um, network data. So they only um, analyze those paths that were um, receiving such input. But you can imagine that if there are many such paths that are receiving such input, or one of these paths are actually branching a lot, then you end up with the, the very same problem we had earlier. So you have, um, although you reduce the, the amount of paths quite a lot, you still have too many of those um, to analyze. Um, a different strain of research um, focused on symbolic execution. Um, and this particular work um, was concerned with um, generating inputs for, for exploits. But what they did was to um, um, represent the code symbolically, which allowed them to more freely um, navigate throughout the, the code without actually executing the, the individual paths. Um, but again, if you really um, um, represent the whole code symbolically, you end up with the same problem or a similar problem um, you had earlier with um, enumerating the paths. So your state space is simply, um, or grows too big. Um, Russell, for instance, tried to tackle this by um, introducing um, multi-execution, which still makes use of symbolic execution, but they aren't um, themselves along the, the normal or the, the intended path of the sample. So they execute the, the sample and whenever they, they hit the condition that is um, involving some um, environment sensitive data, um, so they simply um, symbolically execute both branches and at the end they evaluate the, these branches and kind of merge the, um, the data that did arise. Um, what all these approaches have in common is that they are kind of focused on the input or the normal execution. So they're really um, top to bottom and with Gordon, we're doing things um, a little different. So we first have a look where we actually want to go, and then we actively guide um, the analyzer towards those, those regions. And those um, interesting or indicative um, code regions might be um, branches that um, dynamically load the code using this load movie function, for instance or paths that contain simply a lot of instructions. So we, we can see this um, approach somewhere as maximizing the, um, the code we are actually analyzing. And this not only um, locally, but globally as we are also um, analyzing the, the files that are, um, that are loaded dynamically. And we're doing this in a, a two-step procedure. So first we derive the, the control flow graph um, statically, and then we make use of the, the control flow information to guide the, the analyzer. So similar to, to, to Russell, we are following the execution paths, or the intended execution path at first, and when we hit uh, a condition that is involving one of these environment checks, we are actively forcing one of these branches in order to end up in the region where we actually wanted to go. And in doing so, we also um, note down um, which of the um, branches we already visited in order to um, not visit any execution path um, twice 
um, in subsequent runs. So in the first one, we might um, go, go down um, this path um, because down, down there is this um, load movie function which we um, um, located earlier. And in the second one, um, we go down um, this path because it simply contained um, the most inst instructions um, to analyze. And this is how it, um, it looks like. So this is an, well, an excerpt of a report of, a, of another um, sample. And on the left, we have the, the number of the um, execution run. Um, the offset of the um, instruction, the instruction itself, and their parameters. And what we see um, here is that the, the sample is assembling this um, flash util spider array um, name of the object um, out of um, little substrings simply to avoid um, static analysis. And once it um, did that, it um, instantiated um, the object by, uh, by name. Um, and then it proceeds. Um, so again, for, for the human analysis, this is um, quite nice to have this verbose um, output, but again, for um, the automatic processing, it um, makes sense to um, get rid of this metadata and just um, concentrate on the, the essential. So this um, directly brings me to the detector we have implemented. So first, um, in order to really make use of these reports, we need to um, pre-process those. And for the structure reports, um, we simply take this um, compact representation I showed you earlier, so only this list of um, tag IDs and, and brackets. And for the execution reports, um, we only look at the instructions and their parameters, whereby we replace the um, parameter values by um, the types to replace, so in the, in the previous example, we had these the strings, and we replace these with the, this common string token, simply to make sure that we are not overfitting on one um, particular um, sample. Um, then we somehow have to um, make vectors out of these um, this reports, and this is this, this embedding using Angular models, but I'm talk about this um, in a second. And then we'll use these vectors to actually train our classifier. Um, so these, these Angular models are, are used to um, embed string data in, in vector space. So coming up with some vectors. And this basically is um, a generalization of this bag of words model you might have heard of. Um, so you're representing the string as a collection of, or a bag of, of features. And there are different variations thereof. So the classical bag of words, um, think of your input string as, as a sentence, and you split up the sentence using um, some delimiter characters, spaces for instance, and then you end up with your, your words, and you represent your, your sentence as a collection of words. And the very same thing works for, for byte engrams. And engrams or byte engrams are basically um, substrings of a particular length, um, which we extract from this input string. And what you usually do is to simply move this sliding window over your input and extract at each and every um, position the substring of length n. And the same thing works for, for words as well. So you again split up your input string according to these delimiter characters, and then you move the sliding window containing out of n words, in this case three, over the input string and have these substrings that is kind of modeling the, the number of words. And this nicely shows that um, the, the classical bag of words is actually a specific, specialization of word engrams just with um, n equals one. And this doesn't yet make um, any, any vectors, of course. We simply split up the, the, the input string somehow, and now we um, have to map those engrams to dimensions in, in the vector. And 
So you could either enumerate all those engrams again, but what um, one does in, in practice usually is to um, simply hash um, these engrams. So don't think of a, a cryptographic hash, but a much simpler one, which is giving you, for instance, a 52-bit number. And this number is then used as um, offset or index within this, this vector. So we do have um, the position where we want to store our values, but no, no values yet. So, and this is the actual um, embedding, and there you have um, different um, options again. So either you simply count them, so you count the number of um, that specific word in the input string, or you say, okay, this, the word string actually contain, is contained in, in my data at all. So you have this binary embedding. And the nice thing about it is that, well, this, this vector is getting really large, which is, kind of a problem if you want to pr uh, process it. But the nice thing is that most of these um, dimensions are actually zero. So you only store those that are not zero. So you can imagine this as a hash map where you simply store those values that contain a value that is not, not zero. And assume that everything that is not contained is actually zero. And this lets you store the, the data pretty efficiently. Um, apply to our um, reports, um, we simply um, extract four grams of such um, tag ID, and I, I highlighted the um, defined binary tag and two ABC tags over here. So what you might expect is that these um, tag IDs end up in a separate feature because those seem to be really indicative for, for the model. Um, but what actually happens is that it gets split up over um, different engrams, and the classifier will learn that all these little fragments get a, a higher weight, and all together they are um, increasing the weight for this particular um, sequence um, in order to indicate that this is actually, or might be, um, a malware sample. Um, the same principle works for um, the instructions and parameters. So we again move this sliding window over um, this input. And again, the nice thing is that we are not manually constructing any detection rule. So some methods before um, propose that they are um, counting instructions or checking call frequencies. And this is all basically modeled implicitly, but also the um, relation between instruction and parameter and parameters um, among each other, but also um, instructions to each other. So there's way more which is implicitly modeled without us actually um, intervening, which is pretty nice. And yeah, these vectors are then um, used to learn our classifier. Um, so at this point we could basically use pretty much any um, learning algorithm that actually allows for um, supervised learning and classification. Um, but we simply went for support vector machines as they are really um, efficient and among all um, robust. And the basic idea behind is that um, we are learning a hyperplane, which means this is separation between two classes, so um, benign and malicious, and are trying to maximize this margin, this, this distance between the, the two classes. And also, which is really nice about um, support vector machines is that they allow for um, regularization by softening this, this hyperplane. So you might have noticed that here we have this little um, red data point on the green side, and over here um, this green point on the, on the red side. And so the support vector machine is, is learning that the data might not be perfect, but it's still um, attempting to draw this line as good as possible to, to separate these classes. So it allows you to kind of compensate for um, mistakes in, in the data or, well, it might even be that the, the data wasn't um, separatable to begin with. Okay, so, um, 
then we evaluated all this um, on about 26,000 um, flash animations that have been collected over a period of 12 consecutive weeks, um, whereby about 7% of those have been actually um, been malware. And we have been, well, of course, interested in whether our method works at all and how well it works in comparison to um, other methods. Um, but also, um, we applied Gordon in this continuous setting, so operated one week after another in order to kind of simulate, uh, simulate um, this application in, in production. And also, we still have to evaluate if this, um, this two-fold analysis um, actually makes sense or if one of those actually would have been um, um, enough already. Um, so for the two um, experiments I'm going to show you um, in a minute, we split up the, the data in six weeks of training, three weeks of um, validation, and three weeks of testing data, thereby um, strictly um, respecting the temporal order. So we make sure that we um, only test on data that has been collected after the training data, right? So we we don't want to, to learn on the future and predict the past. It doesn't make much sense in, in reality. And for the rate related approaches, um, we had a look at Flash Detect, which is a ExtraScript 3 detector that has been presented by von Overwald in 2012. And yeah, we adjusted it to 1% of false positives. And for the particular experiment on Flash Detect, we removed um, flash files of version um, 8 and before as it's only a detector for um, ExtraScript 3. Um, additionally, we had a look at um, the virus scanners that have been listed at um, virus total. And in our experiment, so here we, on, on the graph, I plotted the um, detection rate for the individual uh, method, and it turned out that actually, unfortunately, um, didn't work out that well, so it only detected about 26% um, of the, the malware in our data set. Um, however, Gordon, with the same false positive rate of 1%, um, detects 95% of all the, the malware samples. And even if we adjust um, our method to um, 0 0.1 false positives, um, we detect 90% of the samples, which is pretty good. Um, yeah, in comparison, the um, virus scanners, or the, the five best virus scanners at virus total, um, detected between 82 um, and 94 percent of the, the malware samples. And of course, um, virus scanners kind of have these, these virtual um, zero percent false positives, which we will never reach with a learning-based um, detector, of course. So um, I do see Gordon kind of as a complementary um, tool for bootstrapping such traditional approaches, um, simply to kind of spare those other methods the, the effort to um, skim through these large amounts of malware data. Because after all, Gordon is really um, operating without uh, manual effort um, at all, um, so this is pretty nice. Um, here we have the detection rate over, or the, the true positive rate over the um, false positive rate, which is a, a rock curve. And what you see here is that in the um, deep curves over here, um, we see the detector operating only on one of these two um, analysis steps. And we see that at the um, false positive rate of 0 0.1, um, the individual um, analysis steps only achieve a detection rate about um, 60 65%. And the combination thereof, so Gordon uh, boosts this to 90%. So you indeed have, well, you, you need this twofold analysis to actually address the different um, aspects of flash model. Um, finally, um, we have this experiment on this um, temporal um, application. So here we have the detection rate for um, each and every week. So we're starting with week three because we are um, training on the first, validating on the second, 
and then predicting the third. And for the fourth, we take two weeks of training, one week of validation, and the fourth for testing and so on. And what you nicely see here is that at the beginning, um, Gordon is not, is not performing that well. And this is quite natural for, for learning-based um, approaches. So they, the more training data, and we increase the training data over time, um, the better it actually works. So the more knowledge the, the, the classifier gets, the better it is. And we see a, a, a nice trend towards um, Gordon's optimal performance. Um, so in summary or in conclusion, um, we presented Gordon as this um, comprehensive analysis slash um, based malware or animation in general. So we have this twofold analysis. So the, the structural analysis for um, structural exploits and the, the guided code execution for dynamically analyzing um, action script code, um, which lets us nicely direct the analysis towards these, these regions we are actually interested in. And based on these steps, we implemented this detector, which detects um, a large variety of um, specialist malware with 90 to 95% um, as the detection rate, low false positive rates, and that actually makes us the, the best learning-based detector out there um, at the moment. And as I mentioned earlier, um, I see the field of application for, for Gordon more as, uh, as bootstrapping st um, steps for traditional approaches. Um, thank you, and yeah, I'd be happy to answer some questions. So you correctly the, the question was um, if we're extracting engrams and we're actually um, extracting these engrams over encrypted data. Yeah, so of course. Um, and that's why we're doing this, this dynamic analysis of extra zip code. And doing um, this dynamic analysis, we actually um, look at the, the unpacker code as well. And on the procedure of unpacking the malware. So we will first see the, the unpacking routine and then the process of actually unpacking it until we actually execute the unpacked um, code. So we are not extracting the, the engrams over the, the static code, but only on the, the tag IDs. So statically, we're only looking at the structure and dynamically at the code. So we will only see the, the executed which is then already unpacked. Come again? Um, we actually extended um, Lightspark and, and Dinesh in order to um, um, cover both um, versions of the, the extra script VM. So we simply extended those, those interfaces. Yeah. And then ran that stuff in, in the sandbox such that nothing bad happens. So you're welcome. Yeah. Maybe on the ground loop, um, you're actually using malicious and benign applications to yeah. actually evaluate. Yeah. Any idea how precise it is or how actually it does take time to be evaluated? Um, of course, we are um, relying on those labels, and those labels are um, received from, from VirusTotal. So this, this data collection happened through VirusTotal. And what we did is, um, so they are listed, I don't know, 50 or so virus scanners at virus total. And what we, what we did was say, if three of those virus scanners are actually saying this is uh, malicious, then we say it's malicious. If none of those are actually saying, okay, it's benign, it's benign, and everything which is between, we simply discard for the evaluation. So it's true we are relying on, on those labels. 